Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Howard Yermish, John Atwood, Pat, and so many new patrons. Welcome, James, Garish, Napas, and Gary. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you. On this episode of DTNS, Apple's got new iPads. OpenAI is doing its best to get ahead of regulation and what it means that Amazon is launching in South Africa. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 7th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From just the edge of Atlanta, I'm Nika Monford. And from the suburbs of Atlanta, this is Terrence Gaines. And I'm um, the show's producer, Roger Che. It was a brief Apple announcement today, uh, but, you know, it was substantive. Uh, so we got the Snob OS crew to join us. Thank you both for coming along. Not a problem. Absolutely. Not a problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to talking about some iPads, but let's start with the quick hits. ByteDance launched, it, <laughs> launched, filed its federal lawsuit Tuesday. You could call it a launch, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Challenging sure. the constitutionality of the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversary Controlled Applications Act. That's a U.S. law that requires it to sell off TikTok USA or face a ban on the app's distribution in the U.S. ByteDance filed the suit in the Federal Appeals Court of Washington, D.C., and saw a court order to stop enforcement of the law, pausing the nine-month ticking clock the law currently gives ByteDance to sell. The suit claims a violation of the First Amendment, unlawful taking of private property, and unconstitutional legislative punishment, a.k.a. violation of the Bill of Attainder Clause. Congress is prevented from punishing companies or individuals by legislation. Courts have previously sided with TikTok against executive orders and state laws, but those cases left open the question of what effect a federal law might have. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little more in GDI, too. Researchers at Leviathan Security Group developed a method of attacking VPN apps so that some or all of the traffic meant to be kept private could be monitored by the attackers. The attackers would need admin access to the network you're connecting to for Internet or be able to set up a rogue DHCP server on that network. A DHCP server assigns IP addresses to devices, and the attackers could use that to force the VPN app to connect to it. It and then monitor the traffic on that server. Android is not susceptible to this attack because it doesn't support the method of forcing DHCP server assignment. Other Linux operating systems have settings that will reduce that impact, and all other operating systems are totally vulnerable. The only other mitigation is to use the VPN inside of a virtual machine with a network adapter that is not in bridged mode. Nintendo said Tuesday, quote, we will make an announcement about the successor to Nintendo Switch within this fiscal year, which ends March 2025. It will have been over nine years since we announced the existence of Nintendo Switch back in March of 2015, end quote. The announcement came along with earnings, which saw profit rise 13 percent and sales rise 4 percent. Good move by Google if you're setting up multi-factor uh, multi authentication. You no longer have to give a phone number to set it up. Uh, that lets you avoid using the slightly less secure SMS method of getting a second factor. The changes are rolling out to all workspace and personal accounts. Google also announced a new security offering called Google Threat Intelligence that combines data from Mandiant, VirusTotal, and Google with Gemini 1.5 Pro generative models to quickly identify and respond to threats automatically. It can be licensed by companies as a standalone but it is also included in Google security operations if you're a subscriber to that as a company. And just for kicks, apparently, Google announced the Pixel 8a, the bargain version of the Pixel 8, with a full HD OLED screen, 120 hertz refresh rate, new Tensor G3 processor, starting with 256 gigabytes of storage for $499. Pre-order it now, shipping next week. Disney's Bob Iger told investors that the company will add select live sports and studio shows from ESPN to the Disney Plus service by the end of this year. This follows bringing Hulu content to Disney Plus and in advance of a standalone ESPN product to come in the autumn of 2025. So a year and a half or so from now. ESPN will also be part of a combined sports offering with Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery to launch later this year. But unlike Hulu, only a subset of ESPN content will come to Disney+. Plus. 
Ah, streaming woes continue. Meanwhile, Disney says its streaming services are expected to be profitable by the end of the year. <gasps> streaming woes ending. <laughs> All right, OpenAI launched a tool to help identify images created by Dolly 3. The company claims it can correctly identify images that are made by Dolly 3 98% of the time and only incorrectly identifies a non-AI generated image as created by the model 0.5% of the time. Hence, that's what you call a false positive. It does not rely on watermarks or signatures. It's just looking at the image and deciding based on lots of signals. However, if the Dolly 3 image was modified, they say, for example, by changing the color hue, then the accuracy falls precipitously. It's an unmodified image that it's good at detecting. OpenAI will open its research to people outside of the company in order to help improve its accuracy on the edited versions of images. OpenAI also announced it's working on a media manager tool that will let creators identify their works and select whether they want them to be included or excluded from training OpenAI's models. The idea is that the tool would recognize the text, the images, the audio, or the video, or some combination of all of them across multiple sources once identified. You can already request the removal of images from the training set and control scraping of websites with a robots.txt uh, file, but this would go even further attempting to prevent or allow use wherever the work was found. The tool won't be available until 2025 at the earliest, but, you know, it's in production. And OpenAI continues to strike licensing deals with publishers to get access to their data with permission. Dot Dash Meredith is the latest to sign this. The company publishes People, Better Homes and Gardens, Investopedia, Food and Wine, and InStyle. And it will use OpenAI models in its ad targeting. And in turn, OpenAI gets its content for training and highlighting and answers from ChatGPT. OpenAI now has deals with the Financial Times, Axel Springer, the Associated Press, and a few others, while it is being sued by Alden Global Capital, the folks who own the Chicago Tribune, and of course, the New York Times. So OpenAI, with these three stories that we talked about, doing its darndest to self-regulate ahead of actual legal regulation. Uh, let's go around the horn. Do we think it's enough? And if not, what else would you like to see? Nico, we'll start with you. Um, I have to say it is forward progress. So at this point, any forward progress is is good um, because we already seen the complications and issues as it relates to taking proprietary work um, to to train these models. So I think um, it's a step in the right direction. There's still a long way to go, but uh, definitely a, a step in the right direction. Terrence, and what about is, you? It was, it was to piggyback, it is a, self, a step in the right direction as long as open AI profits. <laughs> Self-regulation really, you know, uh, it benefits, you know, people before, you know, like you said, government re uh, regulation gets in, but are they really self-regulating if they're striking these deals to say, all right, you profit, I profit, you benefit, I benefit, you know, is that really self-regulation? It's like self-regulation should really be, all right, we're not going to do this even though we do benefit. I don't see that happening. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, on the one hand, if you profit and you're regulating, everybody wins. That's not a problem. But I think I know what you're getting at, which is what about saying I won't train on things? And that is where the the media remove the media manager tool comes. Granted, that one's not coming till next year, so we'll see that when we get it, right? I say, and people have to know about it. I don't. How open are they going to be with sharing this thing far and wide? Well, at, at least they did make a public announcement about it. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're doing our part to spread the word. Sarah, what do you think? Well, I mean, going through everything that we just laid out, you know, my, my first reaction was the the, um, the way for OpenAI to identify images that were created with Dolly 3 um, and, you know, with high success unless you change the color hue slightly. Now, most people go, well, okay, I, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. If you wanted to get around this tool, all you have to do is change the image slightly, and then all of a sudden, it's not all that great anymore. OpenAI, I think, to its credit, uh, been pretty forthcoming about these limitations, saying, you know, we, we want to, you know, work with researchers to make sure that uh, we, we make the tool stronger in the future. I think that's really important. As far as partnering with... People Magazine and Food and Wine and InStyle and, uh, you know, all the, that uh, I think that has a lot less to do with 
the information that you're going to get from these publications and more to do with, hey, New York Times, I know you're mad at us, but look at all of these deals that we struck with all of these other publishers. We're trying to play nice. Everybody wins. And to your point, Terrence, it doesn't really work that way, but it's it's sort of a good faith measure, I suppose. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to see? What, what would you prefer to see them do, do you think? Well... I, I think consumers, which inevitably was going to use this or benefit from this, it's like they're waiting on the businesses, the organizations, the corporations to say, all right, this is what it is. This is how you benefit. But I would like for them to say, all right, what do you think? How should we use this? What direction yeah, yeah. we should go? Right. Uh -huh. Before creating all these tools and making all these announcements and then we're stuck with all right well this is what it is you know i, I would like to see some forward uh open i, I guess um uh, transparency that's the word i'm looking mm. for <laughs> more open from open ai is that what yeah. you're asking for? especially yeah, yeah. If, if if we the consumers are eventually going to benefit but then again <laughs> that's not how capitalism works so i get it mm. <laughs> does people still do uh sexiest man alive because i would love to know what open ai chooses yeah they still do, <laughs> they still do. Yeah. well the way this will work is you'll ask chat gpt who is the sexiest man alive and they will say according to people magazine it's this person and then now be able to link to it and it would actually be correct Theoretically. Yeah. You know? well, yeah. So there's that. There's that part, too. Uh, Nika, any last thoughts before we, we move on to the Amazon story? Nope. I think, we, think you guys covered it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sarah, tell us about Amazon getting into Johannesburg. Yeah. So Amazon launched its online shopping service in South Africa on Tuesday. Kind of an interesting day to launch something because it's, you know, uh, an uh, Apple dominated day. But uh, this is interesting. Amazon.co.za, as the domain is going to be known in the country, is going to offer same day delivery and next day delivery with more than 3000 pickup points. The company also says shoppers will get free delivery on their first orders, followed by free delivery for subsequent orders above 500 Rand, which is just over $27, as folks get used to the system. The offerings will be a mix of local and international brands across 20 different product categories, consumer electronics, home small kitchen appliances, uh, with international brands uh, such as Apple, also on offer, says Amazon. So this is not exactly the same as Amazon's most wide offering, but you know, it's something significant. Now, this surprised me this morning when I when I read this news. South Africa has nearly 60 million people. Uh, that's according to the latest census, which was taken in 2022, generally considered the continent's most advanced economy. Uh, Amazon seems to note how expanding in the country is unique, though, noting that 60% of the items sold in its stores globally are already from independent sellers. South African brands in particular stand to benefit from Amazon's help in this case. Uh, Terrence and Nika, not sure if you saw this news today, but it did strike me as, wow, you know, this is a huge market and perhaps a really good entry point for the African continent. Um, so, uh, South Africa ha has been that for other companies, um, but also just surprising that Amazon didn't have the, not that it had no presence there, but to have the, you know, basically the the prime experience, same day, next day, we've got warehouses here, you know, we're, we're going to be highlighting uh, smaller uh, retailers, uh, it, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, kind of cool. Well, kind of cool, but also I'm surprised, like you mentioned, you've already said it, that South Africa's most advanced uh, country in the continent. You would assume that they would have already had Amazon and more specifically Amazon Prime. But even at this launch, it's not Amazon Prime. It looks like it's Amazon Prime Lite. And it begs the question, why is that? Is it um, you mentioned that they've already got independent sellers? Is it? the products that already be sold in Amazon are already flooded the market in South Africa. It's like, what is the, 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 the linchpin or the bottleneck from opening up the full Amazon experience in South Africa? If in fact, what they say is true, that it's the most advanced country in the continent, yada, yada, yada. I think because they don't think they'll get people to subscribe. So they're just giving everyone free delivery and uh, okay. uh, and, okay. and the faster delivery to start with. Once they get them hooked, though, expect them to launch a Prime subscription. Uh, that That's my guess anyway. The first hit's yeah. always free. 
And it's always, and, and, it's, and it's very interesting, as large as the continent is, that I think South Africa is now the second market behind Egypt um, that uh, is getting Amazon Prime or Amazon Prime Lite, depending on how you look at it. As, as large as the continent is, I am surprised that there are only at this point two markets when you do have countries um, that are advanced. Um, when you think of Ghana, when you think of Nigeria, there are, um, mm -hmm. you know, other companies, uh, other countries who I think would, um, you know, benefit from this and have the infrastructure as well. So um, it's interesting to see um, that this is just now the second market that's kind of being, you know, added to, to Amazon Prime. Well, yeah, no, you've it, got, it, it's it's go fascinating, ahead. right? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, you've got Shine, you've got Timu, both in the country. Um, Timu only launched in uh, South Africa earlier this year. Shine debuted in 2020, um, and many people point to, you know, that was pandemic times. Great way to figure out what people want to online shop for. Um, when they had, uh, you know, a few options far and wide. Amazon maybe kind of sat back on this, took some inventory, <laughs> so to speak, pun intended, but, um, and now is saying, okay, so here are, you know, here are some categories, for example, consumer electronics and kitchen appliances and stuff that maybe flew off shelves back in the day saying, you know, why not? Why not get into this market? I mean, we understand how infrastructure has to scale in so many other markets. And now's the time. It's tempting to think of it as uh, Africa, the entire continent had no retail <laughs> delivery uh, until Amazon came, but that's not what's happening. And I think it helps explain why Amazon's taking time to get into the markets. They got into Egypt in 2017 by buying Souk. So they didn't set it up. They bought somebody. They are going into South Africa, in, in, in a sense, to super serve it by saying, OK, we'll spend the money to build up warehouses. You can order from Amazon in South Africa. It's just not going to have that fast delivery and everything that they're doing here. And that's because these countries like Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, uh, et cetera, are served by other competitors. Uh, for instance, in South Africa, there's a company called Take A Lot uh, that dominates the market there. So Amazon has been waiting to see, can we outcompete the people who are already dominating these markets because they were late getting to them in the first place? Yep, that's what I was mentioning. I kind of assumed that the market has already been flooded by somebody else. So Apple's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, sorry, Amazon's like, all right, let's tiptoe into this. <laughs> Yeah. And and so they said they were going to go into Nigeria and they still haven't announced going into Nigeria. And it's been a couple of years since they announced they were. So they're being very conservative about it. Especially, it's, again, it's all about the money. If they don't think that they can make enough money and enough profit um, from, you know, the efforts that it takes to get into those markets, then um, again, I think they will be slow to move. It just depends yeah. on how much money they can make. It's hard to compete to when you're not on the ground locally, when you're not yeah. from there. And these companies that exist understand the markets that they're in. Yep. Well, uh, we are momentarily going to be talk about, uh, talking about Apple's big keynote announcement. It was iPad Day. Um, if you can't get enough Apple, Eileen Rivera and I, uh, who co-host uh, Apple Vision Show, are recording a special edition live at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time tonight in light of Apple's big announcements this morning. We decided, you know, why do it on Monday? Well, we can do it on Tuesday where it's all fresh and uh, we can do some hot take stuff. Do join us live at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Uh, you can always listen or watch on demand as you like as well. Either way, do subscribe now, applevisionshow.com. Did you all know Apple announced new iPads on Tuesday? What? Really? I, yeah, yeah, weird. I, I got up, I made some coffee, sat down and went, <laughs> wow, weird. It's 7 a.m. and there's a yeah. keynote. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Thank goodness for Daily Tech News Show. Uh, now, we're going to talk about what they announced. In case you didn't hear all the details, iPad Pro in 11 and 13-inch sizes, starting at 256 gigabytes now, $999 for the 11-inch, $1299. That's $1,299 for the 13-inch, and up to 2 terabytes maximum storage. Both models have OLED Ultra Retina XDR displays with peak brightness of 1600 nits and dual OLED screens. Uh, plus, and that doesn't mean two screens. It means there's two panels mushed together. Uh, a reduced glare option called nano texture glass. And they're thin. 
because they have a new processor. So 13 inches, 5.1 millimeters, and the 15 inches, 5.3 millimeters. They are the first products to ship with the M4 processor made on a three nanometer process with four performance cores and six efficiency cores, as well as a 10 core GPU that can support mesh shading and ray tracing. There's also the neural processing unit, which handles all the AI stuff. And that can now increase to 38 trillion operations per second, which means it can do its AI stuff faster. Uh, there's also an improved thermal design that helps the performance as well. Before we get to the other things they announced, let's talk about the M4 and the iPad Pro. Uh, Nika, what'd you think? Um, thinner, lighter, faster. That's the, uh, that's pretty much the, synop the synopsis that I got from the new, um, iPad Pros. Um, and it's, it's come to you know what we expect from Apple, um, especially as they create more products, they're going to get thinner, they're going to get lighter, they're going to get faster, and the display is going to be crisp, not all lag, and and pretty snappy. So overall, that's what I'm getting from it. Yeah, parents, anything to add? <laughs> um, I appreciate the fact that they did bump up the. Um, storage entry level to 256 in the iPad Pros. Um, cue all of the videos where people bending the iPads in half. I mean, that's mm -hmm. almost tradition <laughs> at this point, especially that they are super slim, uh, slimmer. Um, well, jury's out on the them uh, putting the, the front-facing camera landscape as mm -hmm. opposed to portrait. I I'm curious as to if people are going to love that or hate it. Uh, but the addition of that will also queue up the annual or traditional stories of do you get an iPad or do you get a MacBook? Because these are more pricier and with the added functionality of the function role of the Magic Keyboard that they also announced, this may be an actual contender to get an iPad as opposed to getting a MacBook. I yeah, you could have a 12.5 inch screen before. Now you can get a full 13 inch screen. Mm -hmm. And the 13 inch screen is thinner than the 11 inch screen, which... Okay, I, I fine. <laughs> I'm like, why couldn't the 11 inch screen also be thinner if they both have the M4 chip? But um, you you did see some folks saying like, I don't know, looks really thin, looks bendable. I wonder if Apple has tested this. Apple has tested this. Uh, not to say that they aren't bendable. Um, you probably don't want to sit on one, but um, they, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I haven't used an iPad on a daily basis for some time now, for, for let's call it five years, uh, maybe a little bit more. And uh, that said, um, I'm always down for a lighter Apple anything. Um, lighter, thinner, that's great. You know, you can put it in a purse more easily, uh, you know, uh, pockets in your pants, all that stuff. Um, the iPad, if it's docked, uh, whether you're doing something with a keyboard or, you know, or just using, you know, a, a case, um, I don't know how much I care that it's like that much thinner. I know that's just a, a cool uh, hardware improvement just to say we did it. Feels um, nicer in your possible. backpack, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I never thought to myself, boy, I love this iPad, but it's so heavy and weighing me down. But again, it's been a while. Um, and I have actually never used an iPad pro. So I, yeah. I'd be curious for the folks who do use, uh, the iPad pro and maybe in a variety of configurations and really, really care about this, uh, do weigh in. Yeah. So I do have the 12.9 inch iPad pro and I have the magic keyboard. Once you add those two together, it's heavy. It is definitely heavy. So I can definitely mm -hmm. appreciate the light, the, the, the ability to make it a little bit lighter, especially when you add the uh, magic keyboard and maybe like Tom said, put it in a case, you know, it does, it, it does, it does hold you down a little bit. Of course, this is for some problems because it's like not even a pound or something like that, but the making it lighter does make a difference when you add all the attachments and the accessories to it. And, and yeah, and Sarah I'm with you, it is weird that the pro is thinner than the air when the air is supposed to mean thin and light, lighter. but 
The air is the air is still technically lighter. Uh, let's talk about the new airs. Uh, we have an 11 inch starting at 256 gigabytes for $599. 13 inch starting at $799. Both can be configured for more money, up to a terabyte of storage, and they have the M2 chip, but upgraded to Wi-Fi 6E. Both the new iPad Pros and the iPad Airs have that front-facing camera in landscape orientation that Terrence was mentioning. Uh, there's also a purple model and support for spatial audio, Sarah. Uh, I love this. I I think if I were in the market for an iPad, which I'm not right now because money's a little bit tight, but um, the iPad Airs um, make a lot of sense to me. The iPad has been more of a consumption model for me historically um, than, you know, sort of a, a creator device. Um, although I did think that even though a lot of stuff that was touted in the keynote is this is what you can do with Logic Pro 2, which I use. I use Logic Pro 2 for a lot of podcasting, uh, engineering behind the scenes. Um so much of it is still lost on me because uh, it's actually supposed to be for like musicians. Um, I just you can kind of hack it to be for voice only with you know with a little bit of audio. But um, but yeah, I I think that the 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 uh, the iPad Airs look great. Um, I know people were excited about the 13 inch. Uh, it was 11 inch before. So so if the price is right for you, I think that that's what this comes to down to. I, I don't know how many people would upgrade just to upgrade unless money is no object. Sure. Uh, let's also tell them about the new Magic Keyboard, thinner and lighter, front row uh, function keys, larger trackpad, $299 for the 11-inch model, $349 for the 13-inch. New Apple Pencil that works with the new Airs and the Pros, uh, and that's it, uh, offers squeeze to select and a gyroscoped to detect when you roll the pencil, they call it barrel roll. It also works with Find My. So when you misplace it, you can use Find My to find it. it sells for $129. And that new Final Cut Pro for iPad that Sarah was just mentioning that can do live multicam during recording with up to four cameras from iPhones or iPads. And that goes along with an iPhone app called Final Cut Camera that works with this. You can also edit off a connected drive on iPad and Logic Pro 2. Includes new AI session players for bass and keyboard. Already had drums, so that adds to your band. There's also a Chroma Glow plugin for analog sound and stem splitter that can pull out bass, voice, drums, and others into four separate tracks. Uh, final thoughts on on the 38 minute iPad announcement, Terrence. What do you got? I am. I like how they've added all of the features to Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, like like some like we already mentioned prior to. But I'm curious as to how many people are spending. Are they still charging the what is the five dollars a month for Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro? I'm curious to see with all those features like the multicam. And all the the lot the broadcasting things with the um, Final Cut camera. I'm curious to see if people are still are going to uh, pay that subscription just for those software pieces. When I think they may have should have included that in that in a, as far as a tier for Apple One, but that remains to be seen. Uh, I definitely like the fact that the iPad Air gets a 13 inch. At first, I was all against the a larger iPad that just sounds ridiculous, and then when I got one, I'm like. I can rock with this. So I, I can definitely see a market for people wanting to get the 13 inch iPad air. I feel like the Apple pencil having find my support is going to be <laughs> the feature that people love the most over the next year or two, <laughs> because uh, that that's a thing that's just going to get lost. I wish the Apple TV remote had find my capabilities as well, because I lose it twice a week. Um, in various couch cushions, but, uh, but yeah, no, the, the Apple pencil, I've never actually used an Apple pencil, not, you know, but besides just, you know, playing around at an Apple store very briefly. Um, I, I, I know Scott Johnson is really stoked about this. He's going to be with us on the show tomorrow to talk more about this from a creator standpoint, um, because Apple, they were pushing that hard. Um, and sometimes I feel like these keynotes can feel you know, for consumers, like sort of like, well, I don't, you know, I'm not a musician. I, I, you know, I don't know how to use Final Cut. I, you know, Apple Pencil seems cool, but I'm, I'm not much of a, you know, a, a, um, a manual sketcher of, of kinds, but that's what Apple's doing is saying, if you're a student, you know, if you're in the medical field, you know, we've got you covered with these devices. And I, I thought that they made that very clear today. 
It seemed Nika. very targeted. Yeah, it seemed very targeted as far as the air seemed more to me like uh, every man, so to speak, um, for using the for the, for the new iPad. Um, the Pro, it seemed really targeted to creatives on the creative side of things. And again, blurring the line between do I need a MacBook because... I have a 13 inch right here. I can get the magic keyboard. Do I really need that? Do I need to lug my my main driver around with me, or can I just take my iPad and still be able to create and 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 edit content and and manage content on you know something as light as, as an iPad? So um, it did seem to me pretty targeted as far as purpose driven. Yeah, I think if you have a purpose, or you've never had an iPad and you want one, uh, or you really need that 13 inch screen. You know, 12 and a half is just not enough. Um, you you could upgrade, but otherwise, you know, I don't think it's a must have. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Derek, uh, who says, DTNS frequently reports on streaming prices going up and supposedly everybody's spending more money. Derek says, I'm not spending more money. I dropped cable. I've been, uh, I have more quality entertainment options for less than what I used to spend on cable. However... If you want to spend less, get basic internet for me. This is 300 me megabyte uh, option for $60 per month. Pick one or two single services. Call them $15 each. Then you have more entertainment options than you had 20 years ago with cable. Inflation adjusted. You're spending half or less. Live sports, the only complication, I get that. Derek says, for me, I can pay annually for F1 Live. There are other options for other sports. We seem to be hung up on having it all. And then whining about it because we can't have it all while spending less money. But here is Derek's great idea. And he says, this is with a hint of sarcasm. To all DTNS listeners, cancel all but one of your streaming services. If after 30 days you don't miss them, take half of what you saved and sign up or upgrade your Patreon level for DTNS. Win-win! <laughs> if my speculative math is correct, this should double or triple DTNS Patreon revenue. Oh, Derek, how I wish that were true. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I think... There, there is a bit of, do you need all of these services? I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of being like, yeah, but if I cancel Disney Plus, there's going to be something that I need and I can't get anywhere else, so I'll just keep it. But am I using them? It's a little bit of like, you know, do you throw away the stuff in your closet you never wear and miss it later? Well, maybe, but probably not. I like the way Derek thinks in yeah. more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we should uh, wrap up the show, don't you think? Thank you, Terrence Gaines, uh, for being with us. Uh, appreciate you, as always. Uh, I, I, obviously, you and Nika got Snob OS going on. Tell us about that and anything else you got. Yeah, I was definitely going to say you can definitely find me and Nika. I'm one half of the Snob OS, where we talk all things Apple and then some. In addition to that, uh, myself, Rob Dunwood, who you all should know, who's a regular on DTNS, and Stephanie Humphrey, we do the Tech John, where we talk all things tech from a multicultural perspective. So definitely check us out there. You can go to thetechjohn.com or find us on all social media platforms at the Tech John, J A W N. Fantastic. Go subscribe to that and Snob OS cast. Get the Snob OS show. Nika, uh, tell us more about that. And uh, as Terrence mentioned, I am the other half of the Snob OS show. It is an uh, Apple podcast. Where we talk all things Apple and then some uh, definitely go to snoboscast.com to check us out. And we're also on social media at snoboscast everywhere as well. And for me personally, you can find me at Tech Savvy Diva on all of your platforms. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk a little more about that TikTok court case filing, filing and what it actually means, what they're doing, uh, how it might not change things for you right away. It might kick the can down the road a little bit. And I think if we have some time, we'll talk about Apple announcements in the context of the different way they made this announcement and our thoughts about their strategy in that a little bit as well. Stick around. Reminder, we do the show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. As I mentioned, we're back tomorrow discussing the artist view of the new iPad Pro and that Apple Pencil Pro. With Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>